This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Roy Anon. Thank you very much for joining us. Keeping a marine aquarium is, in general, much more challenging than keeping a freshwater aquarium. However, nature shows, public aquaria, and visits to coral reefs continue to draw people to the marine aquarium hobby. Some prefer fish-only tanks, while others enjoy the greater challenge of caring for more elaborate mini reef systems. As the marine portion of the aquarium hobby continues to increase, Greater interest in sustainability of the industry has resulted in more oversight over wild capture and increased interest in marine ornamental aquaculture. Ocean's Reefs and Aquariums, better known in the industry as ORA, is the largest producer and seller of marine ornamentals in the world and is based in Fort Pierce, Florida. With us today is Dustin Dorton, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of ORA. Dustin will explain more about the marine aquarium hobby what's involved with marine production, and aquaculture's role in sustainability of the industry. So we'll be right back with Dustin after these messages. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. With us today is Dustin Dorton, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Oceans Reefs and Aquariums. Dustin, thanks very much for, for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Roy. So, a couple of the things I like to ask at the beginning is a little bit of kind of personal history. How did you first get interested in aquariums? Oh, geez, I don't even know. I, ever since I was a kid, I've, uh, I've had fish in uh, one way or another. I know when, when I was really, really little, I had some goldfish in a bowl, and uh, I remember my, my father kept, um, kept fish when I was young, and uh, I remember one of my first tanks was like a 20-gallon hexagon tank that I, uh, I always thought it was cool to add every kind of fish chemical laying around the house into. I, I remember specifically liking the, the blue color that all the ick medicines turned the water. <laughs> And uh, I think I actually ruined some furniture with that stuff too, if I, I remember right. But uh, uh, so, uh, anyways, I've I've had I've been keeping freshwater fish my my entire life, and uh, kind of for some reason when I was uh, a teenager, I think 14, 15 years old, I um, just had a dream of working in this fish store that was that was located near my house, and uh, actually. I remember I thought it would be a good idea, and I, I, it would help me get the job if I like memorized the scientific names of of all of the fish that the store sold. So wow, that's pretty flash, good. I made flashcards for that and everything. Um, so I don't know; it's just been something I've wanted to do my my entire life. Now you're from California originally, right? Which which part of California? The Los Angeles area, uh, specifically the San Fernando Valley. Okay, and and I think you you had mentioned that you were really into freshwater planted tanks for a while before getting into marines. Yeah, I um I think the the actually the last fish tank I had was a uh, was a was a freshwater plant tank. It was a 100 gallon tank and uh I've I've, I've always really um had an had an affinity towards that the, the, the natural looking, you know, the, the more more natural looking environment rather than just uh you know, kind of the, the fake stuff, just loaded, loaded with fish. My interest in um, 
in the marine tanks actually didn't even develop at all until I started working in a in a store in California, and it just kind of kind of grew from there. So, how did you end up going from California to to uh, Fort Pierce? What was the uh, the uh, all the the events that kind of led up to that? Um, in two thousand, it would have been two thousand, I think. There was a conference in Fort Lauderdale, the um, the Magna Conference, the Marine Aquarium Conference in North America, was in was in, was in Fort Lauderdale that year, and I had um, convinced my boss that it was something I should go and do, and uh, I flew out here to uh, to Fort Lauderdale, and that's where I met the um, some of the some of the people from from ORA, and you know, talking to them about what I was what I was doing in, in California, um, which was, you know, a lot of stuff with with uh, growing um, stony corals, uh, you know, specifically Acropora, Monopora. It was still, you know, relatively new at the time. I guess not everybody was doing it then, like today. Um, so I met, I met the ORA people, and, and they were uh, uh, just uh, getting serious about expanding into... Um, it, you know, a, a coral propagation project here, and uh, about, she's about probably a month after um, I got back, I got an email from from someone here at ORA asking if I would ever consider moving out here, and answer was yes. And just a few months later, I was living in Florida. So, did you did you like the change, or how how did you uh, how did you like Florida versus California? Um. It's different, uh, um, you know. Coming from LA is kind of the the big city. You can pretty much do anything, uh, anything you want, anything you can uh, imagine. Um, where where we're at here in Florida and in, in Fort Pierce, it's um, it's a little. It's like it's a, a big city. Slow. Uh, <laughs> you've been here, Roy. It's, yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> it's far. It's far from a big city. It's kind of a sleepy little retirement area with uh, with not with not much going on, but. You know, there's, there's a lot of things I really like about Florida. It's um, it's uh, kind of it's allowed me to to you know kind of pursue one of my you know my current hobby is uh, growing orchids actually. And, okay, uh, I think yeah, I actually I think I've seen some of your uh, pictures online. So yeah, yeah, the, the climate here is a lot more conducive to that than it is in California, and that's kind of kind of my uh, my passion here. So now, what are your duties at ORA? What's kind of your um Big picture, and then maybe day-to-day sort of duties. Big picture would be um, I, I pretty much oversee all of our um, all of the, uh, the, the the production on the um, the fish and um, and coral side of, of things um, here in in Florida. Um, I also um, am uh, I also oversee the operations of our overseas f- facility in the Marshall Islands. Um, I'm actually preparing to leave for there tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I guess that would be kind of a broader overview. Um, some of the some of the other big things I do here, I'm pretty heavily involved in the sales department and um, very, very much so involved in um, just our, our general um, facilities, um, uh, maintenance and, you know, new, you know, new building uh, design and, and, and modifications to existing buildings. Now, on a daily basis, geez, what do I do? Where do I start? <laughs> seems like uh, seems like 20 million emails. That's the uh, that's 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 probably the biggest thing. But uh, now, mostly it's just uh, just you know walking through the hatcheries, checking on everything, making sure there's no problems with the fish that day. Um, you know, seeing what's new and exciting that's happening in the larval room. Um, checking in on on how uh, say some of our new uh, you know. Whatever newest broodstock fish we have going, um, you know, seeing seeing how they're doing, any new spawns, anything exciting like that, um, and, you know, similar stuff in corals, seeing what's what's uh, you know what's what's growing good in the greenhouse, what we have, uh, you know, that's that's doing really well, and you know, maybe coming up for release um, for sale soon, and um, and then uh, you know, just spending the rest of the day working out problems and uh, planning new ways to uh, bring more products to market. Okay, that's great. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like you're pretty busy. So in terms of, um, I guess, ORA, can you give us, a for the listeners, maybe a brief overview of the company? You know, you don't have to get crazy detail, but maybe just to give them an idea of the scope of the 
uh, animals you work with and the size of the operation, that sort of thing? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, uh, ORA is uh, a, I guess, a pr- primarily a, a fish farm, a saltwater fish farm, and we also operate as our own um, our own wholesaler. So we we distribute all of the um, all of the fish and corals that we grow to uh, retail stores and um, other wholesalers um, throughout the United States and also throughout most of um, Europe and several Asian countries and um, South America and you know a, n- a number of other places. We our primary focus is on. Um, Saltwater fish, uh, corals is a um, is a small but 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 growing aspect of our business. The most common fish that we raise, probably the fish that we're most well known for, is the um, is, is fish um, in the the clownfish group. We raise nearly every commonly available species of clownfish. Um, we're also um, we also breed. The, the the other major fish groups that we breed would be the uh, the gobies. And blennies, as well as the uh, the, the dotty backs or uh, basslets or pseudochromus, what you know, whatever you may want to call them. Um, those are those are probably the three major groups. And then there's some other ones that we raise, uh, you know, little bits of here and there, uh, cardinal fish, um, some seahorses, some other um, basslets. And then, uh, as far as corals, we're working with. Um, Mostly, uh, just mostly hard corals. Um, so that's going to be your uh, the Acropora, Montipora, Postlepora, Stylophora, the real common, um, hardy, fast-growing, um, reef-building species. And then we do some um, some some soft corals as well, just more more beginner-oriented corals like uh, Xenia, some of the leather corals, so Cinellaria, Sarcophyton. Um, Things like that. I think uh, just just actually over the last couple of days, I've been working on a, you know, trying to total up just how many species we've we uh, we have in production and, and have raised, and it was actually quite a bit higher than um, than most of us thought. We um, we counted up um, 61 species that we've successfully raised here. As, as wow! Fish go right. And, That's amazing. And um, almost all of those are still currently in production. Um, and that's that's not including any of the hybrids or the, you know special varieties of fish that we've that we raised, and we really didn't go into too much detail on that. And just off the top of our head, counted an additional 20 varieties or hybrids on top of those 61 species. Wow, so and, probably and, pretty close to a hundred different fish. Yeah, that's amazing. And then all the inverse too are, is probably a huge number. Corals is somewhere around. Uh, as far as what we have like on the market currently, they're probably somewhere around 50 to 60. Um, as far as the number that we're that we're currently growing and, and tracking in our inventory system, it's pretty close to another hundred animals. Okay. 100, 100 species. So it's 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 pretty uh, it's it's definitely bigger than even I realized until just a few days ago. And I know your market obviously would be primarily mm-hmm. U.S. I assume you also sell quite a bit overseas. Mm-hmm. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, the uh, we have customers in strange places. Um, we actually have a couple couple big customers in um, in Russia. That's been a new thing for us over the last couple of years, and um, actually maybe two years or so. And see, where else do we ship to? That's kind of strange. That's pro- Russia's probably the the one that, that surprises me the most. There's a few other a few other Eastern European countries now are are, are just starting to you know gain interest in. Um, in, in, in aquarium fish in saltwater aquaculture aquarium fish now that's great yeah you, you definitely have uh, I know you, you and your company have a, a pretty great reputation uh, worldwide and definitely in the US so it's uh, well deserved I um, want to talk to you a little bit more about maybe picking one or two species and talking a little bit about production and also maybe get some of your thoughts on uh, wild capture and aquaculture and, and how they are kind of intermingled in the hobby. But um, first, I think we'll have to take a short break and listen to some messages from our sponsors. Molly, here's your dinner. (coughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. 
The cat tree tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. With us today is Dustin Dorton with Oceans Reefs and Aquariums. We're going to continue talking a little bit more about uh, the marine hobby and a little bit more about some of the production there at ORA. So, uh, so Dustin, I don't know if many people are really aware of how any of these fish are being produced uh, in aquaculture. Can you give us maybe a really brief insight into maybe one of the one of these species? How about a clownfish? How, when you guys are breeding a clownfish, what's involved with breeding a clownfish? Okay, yeah, it's a relatively easy easy example to start with. If you take say the the most the most common fish, uh, the uh, the I guess false percula or the uh, ocellaris, uh, ocellaris is a species in that clownfish. Um, the, way, the way the whole process starts is um, you have your, um, your, your broodstock fish, which is your, um, your adult male and, and, and female pair, and we, uh, we, we house those guys in uh, one of our uh, two uh, broodstock rooms where they get... Um, uh, you know, very, very, very intensive um, feeding. Uh, you know, usually as often as four times a day, um, and you know, we feed very, various, various different things. You know, not not foods that you would normally be using on a home aquarium. Uh, a lot of it is kind of, kind of custom blended, fresh seafood type, uh, type, type, type items. And uh, those those clownfish will uh, will spawn. Um, you know, some some pairs will spawn every week. Some, you know, maybe only uh, once a month or so. And clownfish are uh, are known as the demersal spawners. So they're going to lay their eggs on some type of substrate. Um, in in nature, that would be on uh, usually on a rock located near their um, their their host sea anemone. Um, in in our case, that we use um, regular ceramic tiles actually um, for the for the the substrate for them to lay their eggs on. So now I think some folks may not be aware of that, but um, so do you guys need? Do you put sea anemones in all your uh, breeder tanks then, or do they need them? No, actually they they don't. Um, we don't use sea anemones on on any of our of our of our clownfish. Um, in the um, in our in our standard um, in our standard grow out area, I'm sorry, in our standard broodstock areas, um, in in our in our coral greenhouse, we do have some sea anemones which we're trying to propagate that do have clownfish in them, but it doesn't seem to make um, any difference at all as far as their um, spawning behavior, even with some of the more sensitive species. Okay. Um, so definitely not uh, not a, not a mandatory thing. And they will um, live very long, uh, very very long and healthy lives without a sea anemone. Okay, sorry for interrupting. Go continue. Yeah, no problem. Once the uh, once the clownfish spawn on um, on on the tile, it's uh, left in the tank for the the parents to care for it for um, usually usually around a week. It, it tends to be species dependent. Uh, during that time, the the clownfish um, the parents are actually going to tend to that nest. They're going to you know, constantly. Um, to kind of fan it with their fins to keep fresh um, fresh water, you know, moving over it and you know, keep anything from from settling and fouling on it. And uh, when when the nest is uh, ready for, um, for 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 hatching, it's moved into our um, into one of our our larval um, larval rearing tanks, where the the spawn hatches off in the tank and feeds on. Um, I guess uh, microscopic food items. Uh, it's kind of a um, 
the tiniest little uh, organism called a, um, a rotifer, which is um, you know, a, f a food item that we enrich um, in order to deliver good nutrients to the um, to these larval fish. When the um, when the fish are just larvae, they really don't resemble a clownfish in any way. They're just a little um, dark colored, uh, almost black, floating. I mean, it just looks like a little streak with eyes, <laughs> and it, you know, it's not, not not very impressive by any means. But over a period of um, maybe about a week and a half or so after they hatch out of the eggs, they begin going through a, a process called metamorphosis, where their stripes start growing in, and they start to start to truly resemble a um, you know a little miniature version of a clownfish. Um, at, at that size, they're probably around a quarter of an inch long maybe a little larger. And at around a month, month and a half, they're um, ready to be moved out of those larval tanks as little um, little miniature clownfish. And uh, from there, they're, they're moved out to our grow-out area where they, um, they spend the next six months to a year of their life before they reach market size. That's great. So it sounds like you must have needs for quite a lot of space for a grow-out. I guess in terms of volume of water or size for grow out do you have you guys have any idea roughly how much you know tank space you need to, for grow out yeah yeah you touched on that earlier and i i didn't actually didn't finish answering that question for you kind of i guess you're kind of getting into just how big is ora yes yeah um, exactly yeah ora is spread out over a i believe it's a 7 acre piece of land we have jeez we have 1 2 5 Nine, I think we have about eleven hatchery buildings that we're currently occupying. Each one of those you know, buildings is a, they're basically Quonset hut style facilities with met, uh, metal roofs on them. And I think we're I think we're around I think we have around a million gallons of was it half a million? I think it's I think it's around a million gallons of of, of total water volume here. It's it's a wow. pretty pretty large facility. Most of our systems are in the 5,000 gallon plus range, some significantly larger than that. Wow, yeah, definitely, a, definitely a, a very big operation. In terms of, I guess, maybe touching a little bit on, on the corals, can you give a real you know, brief overview on, I guess, what you guys are doing with the corals, maybe you know, a little bit about base and, and um, maybe some of the basic kind of propagation methods? Sure, sure. Actually, let me go back on that for a second. It's it's half oh. a million gallons, not a million. It's a okay. Pretty pretty big difference there. <laughs> <laughs> it's still big. Um, it's still big. For the corals, um, the corals are grown in a um, in a in a completely naturally lit uh, greenhouse. It's you know just like you'd see um, up up north any place for um, for growing plants or, or, or vegetables. Only we've uh, we've kind of customized this. Uh, this, this greenhouse that was purpose built for for growing corals um, inside the greenhouse we have four separate systems again each in the 5,000 gallon range and these uh, the the systems are just you know just packed almost entirely like every square inch with um, with with hard and, and soft corals the process for growing them is, is quite a bit um, simpler than, uh, than than clownfish we uh, we don't rely on on sexual reproduction for for anything that we raise. It's all um, asexual reproduction through um, through fragmentation. Um, that that basically means that we are taking big corals and just simply breaking them up, turning them into um, into new smaller pieces, and um, and just waiting for them to, to to regrow out to market size. Now, how long would that take? I guess normally, if you're you know propagating like a, a couple months longer. One thing that um, that that ORA has done different from a lot of other um, a lot of other people who are out there trying to grow corals is we don't bring in large quantities of corals from the wild or or, or any other source and just cut them up and let them grow a little bit and then sell them as, as an actual uh, aquacultured animal. Um, you know, we don't really think that's the, um, the, the, the right way to go about um, actually culturing a coral. Uh, what, we, what, what we do is we'll start off with 
you know, frequently just a single piece of, of one of, of one coral that will get um, sometimes from the wild, but normally from um, from a, from another hobbyist or a public aquarium, and we'll grow that coral up and. You know, as soon as it say say that say that coral doubles in size, we're going to cut it in, into two pieces. And as it grows a little bit more, we're going to cut those two pieces into four pieces. And then it just keeps growing exponentially from there until we have enough little pieces in inventory to provide us with a a constant supply for our customers, but also enough to um, to to trim back down. Uh, once again, and, and make a new fresh batch. The timing for that um, can vary. Say, say, turning just one new coral into enough pieces where we can start selling it can take as 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 little as two years to as long as I would say maybe five to six years. So we've had some pieces that have taken that long to get wow. to get ready to go. It's a slow, slow process. So what was the biggest challenge, I guess, when you were start setting up the coral facility? It, it was a little bit of a learning experience switching over from, from growing corals um, under um, artificial lighting. So it would be metal halide and, and you know, VHO fluorescence um, in California. That's, that's how I was raising them in California. To a, uh, a, a natural sunlight-based system where you're, you're dealing with um, seasonal and even daily fluctuations in, in, in light intensities. And um, you, know, you have, you have uh, temperature problems with the, uh, with the uh, sunlight. And then as well, you, you tend to have more algae issues. It's a little more difficult to control um, algae once it gets a foothold when you're dealing with um, sunlight. So is it easier or hard? I guess it's harder than to raise it in natural conditions. Is that what you're sort of saying? You know, the I would say that it's harder. It's definitely a lot more work okay. uh, to, to raise them in a greenhouse. Uh, you, you don't necessarily have, um, you know, light bulbs to change, but you've got a lot more algae that has to be constantly maintained, and you, it's really difficult to maintain consistent coloration throughout the year. You know, our, our greenhouse now is oriented to, to, to maximize the amount of... Um, on that the corals get in the winter time, but you know even here in in Florida, um, you know starting about this time of year into early spring with the uh, the short days and the sun you know real low, you know with real low on the horizon, it um, it, it really takes its toll on on coloration and, and growth. I understand? Yeah. So I guess you know we've talked a little bit about the hobby in terms of you know what's good and what's you know what you you guys consider maybe the right right approach and obviously there's been a lot of discussion about the impact of collection as well on you know the environment so what are your some of your thoughts on collection and and uh, aquaculture in reference to the hobby as a whole I personally don't have any significant issues with wild collection of uh, of, of fish and corals as long as it's done in a in a responsible and, 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 and regulated manner, uh, I, I think it's a it's an important source of income for um, you know for for uh, for families in in the areas where where um, you know where most of the fish in the aquarium trade are are found. I, I think aquaculture is an an important. Um, I think aquaculture is important to the aquarium hobby because. It's questionable how long that the I guess the activity of, of wild collection is going to stay sustainable for, as uh, you know other environmental factors may may come into play with the um, with the health of the reefs. Right. Um, and I I think when I look at, at how many clownfish and dotty backs and things we sell, it, you know it it kind of it really makes you wonder how could the wild even possibly produce this many fish. Right. And I think when you see it from an aspect like that, it, you begin to realize the importance of what you know, ORA and, and other and other fish farmers are are doing. So you mentioned the Marshall Island, Islands portion of uh, ORA. What uh, can you maybe give us a little insight into what you know what you guys are doing over there? Yeah, sure. The uh, in 2003, um, uh, ORA um, purchased a um, an existing. Uh, 
giant clam farm that was located on uh, on the island of, of Majuro in the Marshall Islands. And the facility is it's located on a, um, on a on a little one acre piece of land, like right on the ocean. I mean, the, the, there's a, a, a seawall that separates the farm from the ocean, and you know there's huge Pacific Island waves just beating into it all day long. It's really close to the water. Um, the, the the facility is a it's a full open flow through system. There's two large five horsepower pumps that are constantly drawing in water, you know, straight from that, straight from the ocean um, into the clam tanks, and then it goes straight back in into the ocean again. Okay. At the facility, we, we only raise, um, we're only raising native species out there, so that, you know, that type of uh, flow-through system is not a, not a, not a concern from, a, from any kind of environmental reasons. But the, uh, the species we're growing out there are, let's see, we're doing several species of giant clams, the most popular ones are the, um, the the maxima clams, which are the you know the real colorful purples and blues and green ones that you always know, see in pictures. And then the other the other one, probably the second highest production, is the squamosa clam, which is similar to the duresa. It gets a little larger and isn't quite as colorful. Um, in in addition to those, we also um, we also raise a, a number of um, soft and stony coral species. No, oh, that's great. So uh, you, it must be a little, bit, at least a little bit enjoyable when you go out there to uh, to check the facility out. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's a little it's a change of pace from um, <laughs> from uh, from from Fort Pierce. It uh, it makes Fort Pierce feel like a big city. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But uh, it's nice out there. It's a unique facility. Well, that's pretty impressive, and I definitely want to thank you again for taking time out. I, I think we're, we're out of time. I may have to get you back on the show to talk a little bit more about ORA and about uh, the marine hobby. Definitely would like to thank you, Dustin, and our producers here at Pet Life Radio and Aquarium Mania for making this show possible. Is there anything, Dustin, you want to talk about real quickly here at the end? Uh, any uh, ORA-related information or, or such? Uh, well, first, uh, let, me, let me thank you guys for having me on. I haven't done one of these interviews before, so hopefully, uh, hopefully it went, uh, went well. And um, if, if anybody would like to learn more about, um, about ORA, you can visit our website at www.orafarm.com. Sounds good. Okay, Thanks thank you very you. much. All right, take care and uh, enjoy your trip. Have a safe trip uh, there and definitely back. Thanks. If you are interested, uh, we would. I definitely want to encourage any of our listeners to go to the Pet Life Radio Aquarium Mania blog. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, please email me at roy at petliferadio.com. So until next time, visit your pet stores, consider keeping fish, marine fish as well as freshwater fish, and uh, we'll hope to get more and more of you interested in the hobby and expanding your horizons with uh, aquarium fish in the, uh, the future. Thanks very much for joining us, and we'll talk to you soon. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.